how are you? My friend, like-minded one, member of my online community, that's what they call it, don't they? The thing we all need to grow and be part of. But what does that even mean? I'm Helen Perry. This is the Just Bloody Post-It podcast for people promoting their shit on the internet. And this time we're going to talk about community and beating work loneliness. You've got to be careful what you wish for work-wise, haven't you? Sometimes I look around my empty office with just me sitting in it for another day and think, is this really what I had in mind when I started a business to get out of the kitchen and back into the land of the adults. Running your own thing is liberating and empowering, but it can be lonely too, and you end up spending a lot of time in your own head. I've got some business besties that I can talk to and my friends on the internet, maybe you're one of them. My husband will tolerate some work chats before his eyes start to glaze over. But I do often wonder whether I should be part of something bigger or more formal or whether I should build something like that for other people, a membership group. This is something I procrastinate over, not my guest She's not a procrastinator. Lara Sheldrake is the founder of Found and Flourish, an online platform for founders and aspiring entrepreneurs. You might have seen her around. Lara's been featured in all kinds of fancy places like Forbes and Marie Claire. She's an organiser of events, a creator of communities and an elevator of others. It's about understanding where you're in a state of flow and then kind of following that rather than thinking that you have to be on every platform speaking to everyone everywhere but also understanding the ratio of consumption to creation because if you're on a platform consistently consuming it can be draining and exhausting especially because there's so much being said out there so listen on to hear about lara's mission the myth of passive income if things sound too good to be true they usually are we chat about how the pandemic galvanized her business but how that comes with side effects about finding solutions to the marketing things that you don't love doing but you have to do anyway and about how unfollowing is okay. It is so okay. Lara, found and flourish. You say that you're on a mission to eliminate the feeling of loneliness for business owners. Talk to me about that. How did found and flourish found and flourish? I definitely am on a mission to eliminate loneliness um, in business. And it's because um, personally, I've experienced that um, launching my first consultancy back in 2016, after leaving the world of all well, the media world, 10 long years in that industry. And I decided to go it alone, um, as it were. And I I struggled with the, I struggled with the isolation. Um, I absolutely loved building a business and working with clients that became really good friends. Um, but it's not quite the same working with people in that, um, capacity that you enjoy working with versus actually having the support network around you that you need when you're having a really rubbish day. And I think also just having someone to turn to, to ask, you know, oh, is this price right? Or what would you do in this situation? Or how do I fix my website? Which for me, you know, I remember many a night when I would be up until crazy o'clock trying to fix the back end of my website, trying to learn some code and doing things that right now in our community are being swapped almost like skills. And within a matter of minutes, problems can be solved and businesses can move forward much quicker and more efficiently because of that, the strength and the power of the support network that these women have. And there's there's so much around the power of community that is totally um, underrated. And, and that's just a very small, simple example of, I guess, why Found and Flourish exists, but how it came to fruition is um, in 2018, uh, I was on maternity leave. Uh, my son was three months old. I was getting itchy feet and I wanted to get back into uh, work in some capacity. I wanted to at least start talking about it again. I was done talking about breastfeeding, nappies and poo. Um, and I was like, just give me, 
give me something a little bit more nourishing and exciting to talk about. I went on the hunt for a community that I could be a part of, a business community, and nothing really resonated. It was all greys, blues, blacks. It was corporate. Um, you know, it was just colours that didn't excite me and nothing nothing made business look fun um, and feminine. And I know, um, I know there are networks like that out there. And I know, especially now more than ever, we are so lucky with ample op- like opportunities to connect with women in these different groups. But at the time, I personally struggled to find something. And so that's when the idea of Found and Flourish came about. And I guess the rest, as they say, is history. I'm nodding my head wildly <laughs> at, at, at everything that you're saying. I think anybody who works on their own can relate to that feeling of like, well, who do I talk to this thing about? And lots of us kind of for, form these informal little networks of mm. uh, like uh, like our own little found and flourishes that, you know, of people who are doing the same sort of thing. And we feel that I think what it is, the freedom to talk about work that you don't want to offload that necessarily onto your partner, onto your friend, totally. but you can have legitimately just talk about work for an hour without having to yeah, apologize yeah, yeah. for it. Um, <laughs> exactly. Getting ready to chat to you today, I went onto the Found and Flourish website and it's like, wow, what? what world is this? It's yeah. full, of, full of these beautiful <laughs> photos of people together indoors Aww. in gorgeous settings uh, laughing and like being with one another. And that Aww. is, that was, you know, that was the lifeblood of what you were doing before yeah. March last year. Mm. What kind of pandemic have you had, Laura, yeah. as a business owner? And how has that changed what you're doing? Yes. My gosh. How long have you got? (laughs) Um, (laughs) As a business owner, I had to pivot really quickly. And I know that was a real buzzword last year, pivot. I saw way too many gifts of Ross in Friends pivoting that couch up the stairs. But when, is, is there a thing is too many gifts of Ross and Friends? Um, so yeah, I had to pivot quickly and, um, I think I was totally community led totally community led. So I always had the idea of having a membership as a way of monetizing the business at some point. When it first started initially, I never thought this would turn into a business. But when I started to see that it had legs, that was obviously um, kind of an area that I had considered, but hadn't really, I don't know, I, I don't, I, maybe it was just that it wasn't a part of the business model that I was brave enough to explore at the time. And of course, when COVID happened, it gave me this kind of rocket up my bum to actually um, do it. I guess the initial steps for me were to ask the community what they needed, how they were feeling. Um, And I know I collaborated with you, Helen, and loads of other really lovely women. So I think initially I, I just, I was, I went into autopilot. Honestly, it was a massive blur. I did feel a sense of responsibility that I had to just do things right. And I had to do things in a way that provided as much value as possible without needing or requiring anything else in return. And that was genuinely my intention from the beginning. As I started to put on these events where, um, you know, we were encouraging women to learn how to get confident online and you came on and talked about video and um, I think social media and, you know, it, it started to transpire that this kind of information was was desperately needed and also a sense of community where people could meet online and continue those conversations can nurture those relationships and feel like they're able to converse in a safe space I very quickly explored a range of platforms that I could host the membership on and through trial and error and some expensive mistakes I then decided on the platform that I'm using and I guess the way I did it was I think at the time there was lots of bells and whistles and I tried to offer everything. And over the last year, it's been really interesting to kind of um, understand from the thousand surveys and feedback forms I send out from the members, understanding what it is that they really need. And over everything, it's more opportunities to connect and get to know one another. Oh, man, there's absolutely tons to unpack in what you just said, yeah. Laura. You're <laughs> such a... But you, you know what, though? You, it sticks in my mind really strongly, um, your leadership at the beginning of the pandemic for your community and how quickly 
you were on the case in terms of like, right, okay, we can't meet up in real life. Let's do this online. And I have a lot to thank you and a couple of other people for in showing me what was possible in terms of getting onto Zoom and getting people together there. And also just, my God, how much people would welcome it through that time and how much people were like, yeah, I am, I'm, I'm here for this. I'm going to show up at this time. I'm going to book it. I'm going to pay for it. It was something I didn't predict. I couldn't see how well it could work to get people together online. And, you know, you're one of the people that really showed me that. But also in what you just said, there was such a lot about listening to what people want and learning from them and starting to do things and talking with your people. Is that something you've always done? Yes, always. From the very beginning, from the first event we put on, um, you know, there were, we, I asked, what do you want to hear? What do you want to see? Who do you want to listen to? And how do you want it delivered? Um, and even I think back in, oh, it must have been May or June 2019, which was the first Hugs and Brunch, I remember asking, you know, if we were to launch a membership, what do you want from it? How do you want it to look? You know, and there was conversations even back then because women were saying, when you're going to launch a membership. And it took me so long to get over this idea of, I guess, charging for something that at the time I had been offering for free. But of course, then it's about understanding the additional ways you're delivering value um, and in which form and to whom and to how much that's worth. Um, And so, yeah, it's been a real journey over the last couple of years, but I think there is absolutely no point trying to build something and create something for a group of people without asking them first what they need and want. And I think the beauty of being able to host events face to face is that you get to you get to have conversations with people where they tell you things that they wouldn't necessarily um, tell you if you were to ask them in a really simple kind of uh <sighs> survey or um, feedback form way and what I mean by that is you know you can ask questions about you know what keeps you up at night or what do you struggle with and they'll really think hard about the answer but when you just have general conversations and suddenly feelings of you know they talk about feeling isolated or um, anxious about you know going to a certain meeting or the way that they present themselves or visibility. These are the things that don't necessarily come to mind when you're really thinking about what you want to put down on a form, which is why conversations and actually connecting with people is so important because it's also in what they don't say that kind of is a telltale sign of what they need. And that is the beauty of building a community, I think, because you really do get to know people um, so well and you get to understand their motivations, their fears and, and how you can really deliver the most amount of value to have the biggest impact possible. I just think this is where success kind of comes from and you can do this like even on your Instagram like look through the comments look at what people are not saying and what they are saying and what they're asking what are the frequently asked questions and the topics that really resonate it's a really overlooked part of having an online community that ability to talk to them but I think what we've lost in from not having the real life connection is just like the accidental stuff that you mentioned the accidental conversations rather than know the intentional yeah, exactly. please can you give me feedback where people tend to be like quite nice about what yeah. you're doing or stuff like that I see you Laura correct me if I'm wrong as the kind of person who loves to push someone out of the sidelines and into the spotlight and see them do brilliantly like that's your superpower is to facilitate that kind of thing but that you are not necessarily always the most comfortable being in the spotlight yourself. Am yeah, right absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a really lovely way of putting it. And you're absolutely right. And I think that's probably why I do what I do. And, you know, I like to shine the spotlight on others. I've actually tried to work out whether I'm an introvert or an ambivert or I don't know. It's, it's a funny one. I think I'm an introvert. And although I love I love what I do and I love working with women and I love talking to them and connecting with them. And I do get a lot of energy from delivering events and as I say, connecting, but I do also find it quite exhausting sometimes. And I do, I, I struggle. Um, and, and that sounds weird because I put myself in a position where, you know, up until, um, the lockdown, um, last year, I was hosting one to two events a week and I was, you know, I didn't have to do that many events. I wanted to, and, and, and there's a reason why I was doing that, right? Not just for the impact that it was having, but I absolutely like thrive just 
seeing these women do amazing things and learn from one another. I think I go through phases and I'm, I don't think it's a monthly thing. I think it really depends on whether I'm going through a transitional period in my business where I'm having to reflect and think um, sort of strategically and creatively about what I want to do with the business. And I find that I do that every sort of three to six months. I mean, I'm always doing it, but I get to a point where I feel change is needed. Um, and I must admit, like you talk about looking at my site, I probably edit my site three times a week. I'm always changing it um, or updating and improving it. But I, I mean, there are these moments where I don't feel like I have the clarity to show up and say certain things and therefore I won't say it. And I know that goes against everything that you talk about, just bloody posting <laughs> it and showing up. And I do try to do that. And I do try to adopt that um, you know, attitude. And I, and I have your voice in the back of my head sometimes when I just think, just bloody post it. Just what are you waiting for? Cause there's so many things that I have to say. You know about what? And it would just be interesting to hear about that process that you're going through. You're like, yeah. I'm in a, I'm in a deep thought space at the moment. And I find it really difficult to kind of be my public self at that time. Yeah. That's, even that's an interesting conversation. Yeah. And I, I do, I struggle. Um, I think I feel guilty when I don't show up because I feel like it looks like I'm not doing anything when it's actually probably the opposite. But I also feel like there's so many brilliant conversations I have on a weekly basis with women in the community and things I'm learning always. Um, I'm missing out on opportunities to share those learnings and I feel like I'm doing myself a disservice but also the community. So it's really something that I'm trying to be better at. Um, but I've just hired a couple of people to support on the design and the social media side of the business so that this allows me to remove the overthought on how something looks or how something's put together. I can just brain dump my thoughts or my learnings and my my thoughts on something like, for example, we had a really lovely um, hugs and brunch networking chat today with the members. We were talking about what um, life after lockdown looks like and the conversation was brilliant. It was really interesting and very thought provoking. We broke out into groups and we provided this space for women to chat about what it looked like for them what their fears were, what they were looking forward to, um, what support they needed from their fellow community members. And it was such an, an interesting conversation and, and I wanted to share those findings with everyone. And so what I did was I just wrote it all down, um, sent it to Natalia, who's part of the team and she's putting it all together for me, which is great. And then I just don't have to think about it. I'd love to be able to do what you do and literally just just bloody post it. Um, but I feel sometimes it's also important to acknowledge your weaknesses and if you can't push through some of them, it's then finding a solution of how you can overcome them. And if my weakness is perfectionism, showing up and worrying too much about how something comes across or overthinking it because I'm not quite in the right headspace to really deliver it, then just handing it over to someone else who can do it is, is a, you know, a solution. Yeah, I think it's a really good one. I've recently slightly changed the look of my Instagram. Um, Which I'm loving, by the way. Oh, merci beaucoup. <laughs> um, just, and actually, just having a really clear set of design rules and getting a bit more involved with Canva is making it a lot easier for me to turn, like you say, those little moments when you're like, oh, into a post and just get it up there, like just get it up there. Um, and, you know, I would also add at this point that every single person I've interviewed for this podcast so far doesn't think they're good at showing up, doesn't think they just bloody post. Like everybody's- Isn't that interesting? Big, yeah, it really is interesting. It's like my big learning of it from it so far, you know, that really no matter, you know, whoever you speak to and however they might appear to be more confident in you or more sorted or you know in control they can still have a lot of these conflicting feelings around showing up online and it's just a weird part of what we do now do you see it mm. as a necessary evil or something that you can actually enjoy as well I it depends on my mood mm -hmm. <laughs> it depends on my mood <laughs> um I think it should be something that we enjoy because creating is you know, such a wonderful way to express yourself. And I think we put too much pressure on ourselves for it to be perfect. And I think it also depends on whether you're looking at your consumption or your creation. And I was talking about this the other day with Ellen Donnelly, who um, we were talking about establishing your strengths. And she was saying, sometimes it's important just to take a step back and go, okay, well, what are your strengths? Is it speaking? Is it presenting, facilitating, 
could you could you do really well on a platform like Clubhouse, but perhaps you don't like showing up on video and therefore maybe you just say, do you know what? IGTV is not for me. Um, or are you someone who's really good with words and, um, you know, could you have a blog and create all this wonderful content and then not worry about um, showing up in other areas? And I think it's it's about understanding where you're in a state of flow and then kind of following that rather than thinking that you have to be um, on every platform, speaking to everyone everywhere. Um, so I think that's really important, but also understanding the re- ratio of um, consumption to creation. Because if you're on a platform consistently consuming, it can be draining and exhausting, especially because there's so much being said out there. And to kind of take back a bit of control and enjoyment from these platforms, understand how you can express yourself and create in a way that feels joyful. So I think it really depends on how you use it. And it's important to have that sense of awareness, because if you don't have that, it's very easy um, for it to then become like a necessary evil that ends up just feeling draining. Because you're, it's pushing against your natural way of being. I think that's something yeah, I've exactly. really, I've really learned in the past kind of year or so. Is just like let go of that stuff that like I'm, I should do LinkedIn. I should do LinkedIn. I should do LinkedIn because people will yeah, go, oh, totally. you should do LinkedIn, and I'm like, but LinkedIn is like, oh, when I go on there, I'm just not feeling it. But yeah, like, I'm on Instagram and I kind of know what to do. And like you say, you like go. I have, I do my little videos, and you do, you know what? It's like lean into the stuff that isn't hard work that doesn't make you feel crap. Totally, and yeah. absolutely switch the app off and just have fun making something I you know just you uh, there's there's a lot of messaging in in kind of like my community around like make sure you're engaging with other people's content make sure you're connected up with this that and the other person and actually it can be really helpful to step away from the noise and just think what mm. do I want to say and what do I want mm. to create and totally and, you know and try and block it out interviewed Karina who owns the ceramics firm Cornish wear um, and she doesn't look at anybody else on her socials because she just wants to be completely herself she just wants yeah, to just I love want that. It. she just wants to be completely herself and when you start looking at what other people are doing you do start to question yourself I think I totally agree and also subconsciously you might see something and then months later you regurgitate it without realizing and so I made I made a point last year to unfollow any platforms that had a similar offering to mine and it's amazing the difference it makes because you just feel lighter you also don't go on going oh what am I going to see that I'm not doing that I should be doing you go on and you see oh that's nice and you know you can see what your community are doing and it's just yeah it's just easier and whenever you feel those pangs of either jealousy or anxiety or overwhelm that's a red flag to go right okay I need to do something about that and usually it's as simple as unfollowing lots of people are membership curious selfishly I'm kind of fascinated Laura to hear what that mm-hmm. is like you know how difficult how complicated it can be to run a membership or a community and you know do I want to have a membership in future I don't really know but what's what's it like day to day yeah is it um, is it relentless <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it can be it definitely was at the beginning um my business was not making a lot of money pre COVID, uh, pre pre lockdown. It was an events business and it was a media platform and I hadn't yet monetized it. It was still a growing community and platform. Our numbers were, you know, low, but growing. Um, and actually it grew quite quickly, to be honest, over the last couple of years, we've had quite, um, exponential growth, but pre lockdown, we, you know, we didn't really have a business model. And so, um, on the one hand, I think, Having a a membership or a subscription model um, business allows you to have a consistent revenue stream. But at the beginning, when I had very little money or resources, um, not really a lot of time because I was in lockdown with a toddler, sharing my space with my partner as well, which, uh, yeah, is a whole other conversation. And it was absolutely relentless. I burnt out. I was overwhelmed. I had huge anxiety issues. I questioned what I was doing every single day, especially when I had, you know, my loved ones saying, 
just just focus on being a mum for now. You can build this in a couple of years. And I was like, we don't have a couple of years. People need this now. Um, and, you know, I was, I was working around the clock to make it work, along with a couple of expensive mistakes of, you know, implementing the wrong kind of software. And then, you know, just having to do a lot on my own. It was really tough. And I think my advice would be to anyone who wants to set up a membership is just to make sure that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket you have a community that's engaged and wants something from you and you have a support system around you so that you can tap into a network of people ideally who have done it before so I think that's where I went wrong I had a great support network I was part of a mastermind I had some really good friends obviously I had the community and everyone was really supportive but I hadn't actually connected with anyone who had launched a membership before and I think had I done that from the beginning I would have had that insight that I needed in order to not make so many mistakes and to have maybe had a smoother kind of launch process. But it's really funny because I get quite a lot of questions about how I set up the membership because they want to have a passive income and I always laugh. I'm like, it's not passive. I just don't it's think not passive. That, that, there ain't no such thing. I just that, think that, that, that is just the, exactly. the, it's the myth of like digital oh businesses, gosh. I think. Oh like, my just gosh, it's so Build funny. it and they will come. It's just oh, not. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a constant work in progress. Like I said to you, you know, every kind of three to six months and it's probably more like three months, I go through this like, you know, business transition and that, that kind of moment of changing or slightly changing direction or just developing or improving the membership doesn't just happen in that moment. It's like months and months of strategizing, talking, um, researching, understanding what the community needs. You know, it's a constant work in progress. If you stop working at it, it's going to be rubbish because people will start to see other businesses and communities who are nourished and supported in a way that's constantly evolving and you'll be left behind. So my advice would be, don't go into it thinking it's going to be a passive income. Know that it's incredibly hard work and you have to be so passionate about what you're doing because that is the only thing that's kept me through, who's, that's got me through the last 12 months. You know, and and we've, or I've decided not to go down the um, advertising route. So I've not paid for any advertising, marketing or sponsorship. Everything's grown organically and I'm in a privileged position where I can grow slowly and I I acknowledge that because I know sometimes people need growth quickly so that they can you know pay the bills and of course I've needed to make this work financially from day one but I've decided consciously to grow it organically and to kind of tweak it as I go what I don't want is to suddenly pay for advertising have sort of a high level of growth and then find there are all these things that I need to improve on and it impacts hundreds or thousands of people or thousands of people um because at the moment we've got about 350 members um um, so you know it's a slow it's been a slow growth and it's been a really insightful learning curve and I think I'm now at a point where 12 months on I can consider developing or uh yeah investing in advertising and maybe scaling it I think we're all about to enter a new like learning phase when the world I mean fingers crossed touch all the wood starts to get back to normal do you feel daunted about the fact that you've grown this business so far largely in lockdown and we're going to be going back out into the world how does that look for you and your business do you have a feel for what happens next yes that's a really good question and it's interesting because I've had a couple of members um so we're an international membership the majority of our members are in the UK but we have some in Stockholm Berlin France uh, America some of the concerns that have been raised are from those who are outside of the country saying you know I feel like I might not be able to be a part of the community when all the events start to happen in real life again. But I think the general consensus is that, um, and it was really interesting in this conversation because people were saying they now have a taste for what it feels like to learn online, connect online, serve their clients online. Obviously we can't all do business online, but for those who can, they don't actually know if they want to go back to how it was and that actually have a combination. So Looking into trends and speaking to various people who, who do this for a living, the kind of theory is that people will want to continue to learn online because it's really accessible. You can learn, you know, in your bedroom slippers on the other side of the world while someone's talking to you about something which you'd otherwise not be able to attend. But we are going to crave connection. We're going to crave that um, in real life face-to-face -face opportunity to connect 
to speak to one another, to share our experiences. And I think that that kind of need is never going to go away. So it gives me hope because the majority of our events are masterclasses, workshops, um, brainstorming sessions, um, which I would like to continue hosting online. I think, you know, if I can create or facilitate these meetups and events where other people within different areas can host them and really make it their own, I think that would be wonderful. How people think they're going to feel and how they'll actually feel could be two different things. Can I just ask finally, like the just bloody post it idea is about starting anything, whether it's about posting something on Instagram or whether it's about starting a business that you have been holding back on uh, because you're because you're not sure that you've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. What kind of advice would you give to somebody who may be in that place at the moment? There's so many things that come up when you're considering launching something and you're not entirely sure what's the next best move. And when it comes to like ability and confidence and, you know, those feelings of imposter syndrome, Julie Fidel, um, one of my friends always says, that, you know, she asks herself, if not me, who? And if not now, when? And I think it's really important to ask yourself those questions um, as kind of an initial mindset piece. Because sometimes that fear of getting it wrong or that fear of us not being good enough or not knowing enough to do it can be crippling and it can be what holds us back from starting in the first place. And then I think the second piece of advice would be to know that you never, ever need to do it on your own. And that's definitely how I felt when I set up my first business. I did it on my own and I thought, well, there's no one out there who can support me on this. And that's just what people do. They do it on their own. They figure it out. Honestly, find a community that speaks to you, um, whose values you are aligned with, and it will be the best thing you've ever done. When you're stuck or you don't know, um, you know, what you need in the way of contracts or how to put a website together or even just the messaging of, you know, your branding, there will be people that you can ask for their advice on this and you could literally have answers within minutes. And that not only gives you the boost of kind of confidence you need, but it gives you that sort of collective strength and, and power that you're not alone and you're not in this on your own and you don't need to be. So that that's what I'd say, I think, you know, make sure you're surrounded by a support network. And if you're not, find one. There's plenty out there. Lara, thank you so much. It's been an absolute oh, pleasure to chat. Thank you so much, Helen. My big thing I've been thinking about since that chat is how Lara's product was not the finished article when she started and it still isn't. It changes all the time, every few months. We cannot expect to have all the answers when we embark on something. Actually, we shouldn't think we have because assumptions are dangerous things and we don't have to work it all out on our own. If you have a network or a community of followers or customers, listen to them, observe both what they do say and do and what they don't say and don't do. I truly believe it's a really untapped, underused part of having an online following talk to your followers. I think there's room for more on this in future episodes, how to read your audience. Anyway, for now, thank you for listening. Dip into the archives. If you're a podcast kind of person, subscribe, review. It helps to spread the word about the Just Bloody Post-It podcast. I'll be back soon. Bye.